I wanted to talk in theory about the changes in refrigerant that's coming in this next year or so that really consumers are going to start noticing. And the biggest issues is going to happen is going to be for like people that are like handymen and how they're going to do property management um, companies, air conditioning, heating. You know, they're not going to want to change. Not everybody's going to want to change out their whole systems just because they can't get the current refrigerant they were using. And what I'm speaking on is uh, 410A. Uh, in 2026, we're not going to be able to get 410A like we could this year. Right now, I could buy a jug of 410A at the beginning of the year for around $217. And now it's gone up to about $250. And the supply house is telling me just within a couple months, it's going to be about $400 for 25 pounds of 410A. And we saw this back in the day with R22 and, <clears throat> and R12 on on refrigerators right and refrigeration systems and how did we handle it then we can look to how we handle it then how we should handle it going on in the future right because they're always fear monger the refrigeration community will always fear monger and say hey you're not a professional you're not doing it right because you decided to go a different route than what the experts say and the experts in the refrigeration field are just like the experts in other fields of where they are technically correct, but they also uh, push a political agenda. And the political agenda here in the refrigeration world is um, the fear of climate change and how it's hurting the climate, how it's, it's causing global warming and it's causing climate change and that kind of thing. And I really don't want to get into that. What I really want to stick with is the theory of what you can do with a 410A system if you can't get 410A, okay? Or you can't get 410A for a reasonable price. Well, when R22 started going away, what we were able to do was actually uh, use other refrigerants that had a similar pressure rating. Um, when R22 first started going away, they wanted us to go to uh, MO99. And MO99 to me wasn't always the best bet. Um, and the big thing they were pushing with the different refrigerants, because we had MO99, we had 407C, we had uh, 422D, uh, which to me, 422D is the best option. It acts um, the most similar with R22, and it seems to be able to drop in on top of R22 with the least amount of problems. Um, the biggest thing that they were pushing was that these different refrigerants use different oil. But you really shouldn't worry about what oil refrigerant you use unless you're going to install like a 407C unit on a old 22 system. Then you would worry because then you the, the oil on the line set would be what R22 used and the oil on the unit is what 407C used and those would differ. And then that would be the issue. What you should really be worried about is how that refrigerant is going to act inside the system and how you have to compensate to use it. I've noticed with the 407Cs that I can tell when I'm adding it in there that I don't have to add as much in a 22 system. It's like a 75%. Like, so for example, if you use 10 pounds in, in an R22 split system, right? You'd only need to add 7.5 pounds of 407C. Um, it just seemed to um, have a better cooling rate um, for the amount of refrigerant going in. And so your subcool, if you're dumping it on top of a 22 unit, which still goes on to this day, uh, I'm not saying that I do it, but I know people who do. This is all just a theory. We're just talking in theory. We're not telling you what you should do or, or what you should do going on but if you want the theory of what you could do that's what i'm speaking of today um 
your sub cool is not right. You'll notice that we run a sub cool around four degrees Fahrenheit instead of 10. Four to maybe six, maybe to eight, depending on um, how much 22 to four. 407C. Once you got closer to almost all four, 407C, you'd run about about four on your sub cool to get the same uh, line set temperature that you would normally get at uh, 10 degree Fahrenheit sub cool on R22. And this is something very similar you're going to see with a 410A unit. And, and the refrigerants coming out that are competing is 407C. Uh, B, uh, excuse me, not 47, excuse me, 454B or uh, 32. So, or 32. And which one of those would you use in theory if you're going to do a dump in on top of um, 410, 410A? And I would tell you, um, looking at both of them, if I was going to replace the split system, that used to have 410A, I would use a 454B unit because the oils would match and I wouldn't have to do a flush out or worry about uh, oils contaminating um, the R32 condenser compressor oil because in 454B, the oil that's inside the compressor is the same as 410A, but uh, R32 is not, it's different. In fact, R32 runs a much higher heat, and we're going to talk about that. Um, and so you have breakdown of those different differences of oil, which you can contaminate a system with. So you, if you're going to replace a system, replace a condenser, you need to use 454B in theory. But if you're just going to dump some refrigerant on top, 410A is 50% already. R32. So, in theory, you could dump R32 because when you buy a bottle of refrigerant, there's no oil in it. So there's no oil to worry about, no oil contamination to worry with. When you buy a bottle of refrigerant, it's dry. Dry refrigerant, there's no oil in it. So you don't have to worry with that issue. You could dump it on top of a um, 410A system. So let's talk about if they had no 410A in there, right? And you were just going to put all, all R32 into a um, 410A system. You need about 60%. So if it had 10 pounds, you need about 6 pounds to, to get the same amount of cooling as you did in 10 pounds of um, 410A. And we saw this real similar with fridges when we went away from R12 to 134A. We would do a 75%. So if it needed 10 ounces, and that's usually what a lot of R12 systems used in refrigerators at that time, we would do 7.5 ounces and it worked great. It worked great. So if you're, when I read all the literature, it says that um, straight R32, there's only about 60% needed in a 410A system. So it's a lot more efficient of a refrigerant. Um, so in theory, if you were going to dump it on top and how you would charge the units, you would watch your sub cool. And let's say you were going to need 25, you were going to do 25% R32 to 75% of 410A. Because you kind of know how much is in the system already whenever you're charging. You're watching your refrigerant going in. And you know the system holds 8 to 10 pounds on most, most split systems, right? Um that use standard coils. Now, if you have micro coils, you're gonna use even less. But let's let's just say straight, regular coils, not micro micro channel coils, just your typical system, right? You're gonna you're gonna have eight to ten pounds in there. You got a nice little long run set up inside attic. So you got a little bit more refrigerant. This, we're just gonna use ten pounds because it's the easiest, right? You're gonna let's say you're gonna do twenty five percent, right? Then you're gonna see your sub cool being around six maybe eight if it has a higher sub cool in that particular unit um but as you get to more like 50 percent of, of r32 straight in there then you're going to see sub cools more around four and um, maybe even if you had 100 percent r32 you see a sub cool too 
So I'm not charging off of pressures. I'm charging off a of subcool. And that's how you're going to have to do it. And you're going to have to watch your line temp. Your line temp's getting, you know, in the 50s. You're doing pretty good, you know, on a 80 degree day. That line temp, you're somewhere in the 53 to 55 area on your suction. And you got a sub cool of two to four. Then you're doing pretty good. You're going to, you're, you're going to cool that house pretty well. And that's how you're going to have to charge these units. You're going to have to charge these units off of feel, like old school ways of doing it, like off of feel and off of just using your educated uh, knowledge of how refrigerant works in the system. Um, but that's the best I can give you as a gauge when you're charging units that way. I, I personally don't have to worry about this type of situation. I've been doing refrigeration for 30 years and I don't do property management companies and I'm not going to have to worry about dumping on top. We're just, the clients I have will just do replacements. Um, and that's always the best, but that's not going to be the majority of homeowners, especially if you do residential, you're not doing industrial commercial, uh, which I do more of as industrial and commercial refrigeration. If you're doing residential, then you've got people that can't afford to do switch outs that, that just need to be topped off. And they're being topped off every year already, right? Which they shouldn't be. They should be replacing their systems. But that's not how this world works. People just want some uh, refrigerant out. Just add me four to six pounds and let me, let me kick it to the next year, right? What are they going to do if they can't get 410A at a reasonable price? But you can get R32 at a reasonable price, which 410A is 50% of R32. Well... The handymen in this world, the Jake Leg refrigeration guys, which just tons of them out there, um, are going to use it in those systems. And that's just a pure fucking fact. I don't care if people like it or don't like it. I don't care if the refrigeration community um, doesn't agree with it. It's going to happen in theory. And we all know it. And so that's how you would charge a unit. You would set it with the subcool. You're going to need to get digital gauges. You're going to need to get job link um, modules. Those little guys that screw on. That's what I use. I use an analog gauge. And then I have, I'll show you my setup. It's really not set up. Then I use job link fill piece modules that I hook to it that actually give me digital readings for subcool. Um, which I think is the best system. Because there's there's days when you need a, a analog gauge. And at other times, you need those digital readings. So it gives you kind of the best of both worlds for whatever application you're running. Um, I don't like the, the straight digital gauges. Um, I live in an area that has tons of rain. Rains a lot. I live in Louisiana, so um, they're very susceptible to getting water damage. So they don't seem to work as well here, in my opinion. Um... The days of charging a unit straight with an analog gauge system is gone. If you're still doing it that way, I would say that that needs to stop. There's too many affordable digital options where you can actually get it correct out there. And so go ahead and get you a set of those because it would definitely help you, in theory, to charge a 410A system with R32. That's what my... My thoughts, my ideas, you're welcome to leave comments in the, uh, leave any comments you like down below. I wish you have a great day and a good summer because it's fixing to get hot people.